Well, I'm going to serve as the uh, moderator for uh, what's styled as a debate between uh, Michael Stokes Paulson and, and um, uh, Vikram David Amar. And uh, they're going to be talking about uh, the president's authority or lack thereof to uh, decide not to enforce statutes on the grounds that the statutes are unconstitutional. And um, Professor Paulson will be speaking first. Professor Paulson, I'm assuming most of you know who he is. Um, he graduated with a BA from Northwestern University. He got a Master's uh, of <coughs> Arts and Religion from the Yale Divinity School, something I did not know or something I had forgotten. And he got his Juris Doctor from the Yale Law School. He served in the Department of Justice in the Criminal Division Honors Program, served as Staff Counsel for the Center of Law and Religious Freedom, and was an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice. Uh, prior to coming to University of St. Thomas, uh, Professor Paulson was a professor of the McKnight Presidential Professor of Law and other professors of law at the University of Minnesota. Um, as you well know, Mike has written dozens of articles. Um, he's also a co-author of an excellent case book, and he's also um, uh, the proud father of a son, and uh, more, probably more than one son, but he's written a book with his son. That's what I'm trying to get at, uh, and I certainly recommend it to you. It was mentioned earlier. It's, it's, it's a very well done book, and uh, 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 it's an impressive accomplishment for a, a son to uh, author something with um, his father. Um, after Michael makes his points, we'll hear from Dean Vikram Amar. Uh, Dean Amar is like a five-tool player. He does it all, right? He raises funds. He deals with faculty who don't listen to him, probably for the most part. He's a superb scholar. Um, I think he has at least one, if not two, case books. He's a public intellectual. He, he writes, a, I think, a periodic column for uh, justia.com. And so he, he really does it all. And um, I don't know what they're going to say, but I know we're going to learn quite a bit. So with that, I'll let Michael take over. <clears throat> well, we, we've styled, the, oh, I should turn this off. On. We've styled this, can you hear me okay? We've styled this as a debate, though it really is more of a discussion among friends, and I think there will be subtle points of disagreement. Uh, I'm delighted to be appearing with my old friend Vic Amar. Some of you who heard uh, uh, the introductions at the beginning of the Law Review Symposium, I've known Vic, I think, since 1986. Is that the yeah, fall you started 80, law school? 85. 85, more than 30 yeah. years. Uh, since, he, since he was a beginning uh, law student, he was a younger brother of my law school roommate, and I was back at uh, law school for, for some event or another and, yeah. then, and met this hotshot whippersnapper first-year law student named, uh, named Vic Amar, who, who has just become a good friend over the years. We've debated at a couple of other occasions mm -hmm. and appeared in symposia together. <clears throat> and the topic today is, is really just, I think, a fabulous topic. Does the president possess the constitutional power and arguably the duty <clears throat> to refuse to execute statutes on constitutional grounds. Now, this is distinguished from this morning's panel where we're talking about whether the president's executive power entails a power to decline to execute statutes just because he disagrees with the policy. Here, the argument would be that the president has the power to disregard statutes or to refuse to give them effect on the grounds that he has concluded that the statute in its operation or on its face is unconstitutional. And the further point of the question is, can the president do that irrespective of what the judiciary says? Is the power of presidential faithful constitutional interpretation an independent power in the sense that he can take positions at variance with in contradiction to those of the judiciary? Now, <clears throat> my title, and I have a little St. Thomas purple handout floating around so you can follow along and see if I'm actually hitting my points. My title is the president and the myth of judicial supremacy. And my thesis is that the president, by virtue of separation of powers and the co-equal status of the branches, has a fully co-equal and coordinate power and duty and responsibility of faithful constitutional interpretation. That nothing in our Constitution prescribes the judiciary as the exclusive 
or the superior constitutional interpreter. So this is a proposition I first advanced in writing about, around about 1994, 20 some years ago. And I had no idea at the time, of course, that Donald Trump would one day be president. I'm not comfortable with all the implications of my theory of independent presidential constitutional interpretive authority with respect to how it is practiced by all presidents. But if the point is right, and I hope to persuade you that it is, um, <clears throat> it should be a power that exists regardless of whether you like the president or not, whether you think it is a, the president is a particularly competent or expert constitutional interpreter. The power would derive from the office, not from the person, person's personal characteristics or capabilities. Uh, it is a dangerous power, but I think it is a power that exists for good presidents and for bad presidents, for wise, judicious, uh, <clears throat> sensible presidents, as well as for unwise, injudicious, willful, lawless, inappropriate presidents. So to warm you up, I'm going to start with a hypothetical. That, that's what law professors do, right? A hypothetical. So this is one of my favorite hypotheticals. Some of you have had some of my upper level courses, may have heard some version of this or not. <clears throat> but I'll run it by you anyway, OK? Imagine the most unconstitutional statute you can think of. So here, here's my particular facts. Congress passes the Sedition Act of 2017 that makes it a crime to criticize the government of the United States or any of its officers, in particular the President of the United States. This crime of sedition is then deemed high treason and it is punishable um, <clears throat> by death. Okay? In fact, death, let's just make it death by slow torture to add to a constitutional okay. <clears throat> point. The statute further declares the guilt in advance of certain named individuals. Sound like a bill of attainder to you? And it declares their guilt for their past conduct, which wasn't unlawful at the time. Okay, so that's a, uh, what, what, what is that? What is that? Is that a bill of attainder? Or it's an ex post facto law, too, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> In fact, it names me specifically by name as guilty of this crime because I signed a never Trump letter, an originalist against Trump petitioner, right? So I criticized the government retroactively, and so that's made punishable as a crime. In addition, uh, there shall be no trial. Uh, there should be immediate punishment imposed that afternoon. The president's pardon power is specifically abrogated. I've added that feature because law students try to evade the hypothetical. <laughs> and the president is denied all power and discretion as to prosecutorial discretion. He has to prosecute all violators and uh, be punishable by execution by slow torture. And furthermore, the statute will work, the conviction works a corruption of blood and forfeiture of assets for the next six direct generations of lineal descendants of Boston. Okay. Unconstitutional? Can, can we kind of stipulate that it's unconstitutional? The whole point of this is that it is objectively, incontrovertibly con unconstitutional so that we don't have a side argument about, well, that isn't really unconstitutional. <clears throat> OK, so here's my question. Here's my hypothetical. You're the president of the United States. It's my hypothetical. I can dream. I think all of you would be a better president than our current president. You're the president of the United States. May you veto, must you veto the law on the grounds that it's unconstitutional? Would you veto the law on, its un on the grounds that it's unconstitutional? Okay, think about that first. Suppose it was passed in the previous administration or passed over the president's veto and so you don't really have the veto opportunity. May you pardon people who are convicted of this crime or declared guilty of this crime? Would you pardon them? Now, the statute says you can't, but would you defy the statute? And that sort of leads to my next question. May you, the president, decline to execute a statute on the grounds that you have concluded that it is objectively, incontrovertibly, horribly unconstitutional? I'm hoping you're thinking yes. This will be my proposition. <clears throat> now, the courts have not yet spoken, right? So you're being asked to weigh in on the constitutionality and to declare a statute unconstitutional before the courts have spoken. Any problem with that? 
Remember, the statute is objectively, incontrovertibly, unconstitutional. Okay? Suppose that somehow Paulson generates a test case. And it goes up to the Supreme Court, and in a 5-4 decision written by Justice Anthony Kennedy, uh, the, the court rules against me on all counts and upholds the constitutionality of the statute and declares that it is constitutional in all respects. Okay, so let me continue to vary the hypothetical. A second case comes up. You're the president. Identical on its facts, United States versus Paulson. It turns out that Vikram Amar was also declared to be in violation of the Sedition Act of 2017. What I did. Oh, I've never, I've, I've never said an unkind word. You've done word. plenty. I've never said an unkind word about anybody in Washington. Or <laughs> <laughs> As president, are you bound to execute the statute and execute Dina Marr on the grounds that the Supreme Court ruled against the constitutional claim in U.S. versus Paulson? Okay. Are you obliged, in other words, does what had formerly been objectively unconstitutional suddenly become constitutional and transform your executive duty by virtue of the Supreme Court's erroneous decision? We, we can say it's erroneous, right? I think that the decision is wrong. The statute is unconstitutional. Final aspect of the hypothetical, and I'll keep returning to this in my remaining 12 minutes. <clears throat> The Supreme Court upheld the conviction of Paulson and directed you as president to execute him this afternoon. May you defy and resist the Supreme Court's order and judgment on the grounds that it is contrary to the Constitution, that it is objectively wrong. Or do you execute me this afternoon at 145 as directed by the Supreme Court? I sure hope you won't. Now, my proposition is that the president's power as constitutional interpretation is fully coordinate, co-equal with that of the judiciary in every respect and applies to each and every one of the president's constitutional powers. I should hope that you would veto the bill. I would hope that you would pardon people convicted under the bill. I would hope that you would refuse to execute or enforce the provisions of the bill. And if the Supreme Court ruled against you, you would adhere to that interpretation in the case of Dean Amar, and that you would further refuse to comply with the Supreme Court's decision on the ground that it is actually contrary to the Constitution, and your duty is to the Constitution and not either to Congress or to the Supreme Court where they act contrary to the Constitution. Fully co-equal presidential power of constitutional interpretation. So my little outline, and I'll just zip through it, starts with what I call the irrepressible myth of Barber. Now, if you've received a sound University of St. Thomas constitutional law school education, hopefully you will not have uh, imbibed the myth that the Constitution is whatever the judiciary says it is, and that the Supreme Court is the sole interpreter of the Constitution. That is a myth perpetrated from eighth grade civics case books through many law school uh, uh, case books that says that the Supreme Court is the sole interpreter of the Constitution because the court in, in Marbury versus Madison said that it was. The Supreme Court in Marbury said nothing of the sort. Marbury versus Madison, far from establishing the proposition of judicial supremacy over the Constitution, relies on the proposition of the Constitution's supremacy over the actions of each and every branch of government. That's what gives rise to the judicial duty to enforce the Constitution, and that's what empowers the judiciary to refuse to execute, to refuse to go along with the statute of, con of Congress that it concludes is unconstitutional. The idea of judicial review is sort of a theorem derived from the axiom of the supremacy of the Constitution. Sorry to use geometry terms. Does that bring back bad high school memories? For some? I'm sorry, I apologize. Let me put it a little different way. The argument of Marbury is this. The Constitution is supreme law and trumps, so to speak, any actions of government contrary to the Constitution. Okay. The second stage of the argument is the independence of the various branches of government. John Marshall and Marbury says, do we have to go along with the unconstitutionality of a statute just because Congress enacted it? They say, no. 
We are an independent coordinate branch. We have a duty to interpret the Constitution in the performance of our duties, and we cannot possibly be bound by what Congress has said if it is actually contrary to the Constitution. Again, totally consistent with the framers' view of separation of powers. Third step in the Marbury argument is sort of icing on the cake. And uh, it's John Marshall's distinctive contribution to the argument for judicial review, and that is he argues that the obligation of the oath of office, the oath to support the Constitution that is sworn by all officers and all branches of government under Article 6 of the Constitution, means that no one can be obliged to act contrary to what they in good faith conclude is the actual meaning of the Constitution. That would be absurd. He even goes, his rhetoric gets very uh, energized at this point and says it would be a crime, a solemn mockery to make someone swear such an oath and then uh, have to do what they think is actually contrary to the Constitution. So Marbury's argument is if the Constitution says one thing, a statute or any other act of government says something contrary, the Constitution <coughs> prevails and the act contrary to the Constitution fails completely. Now, my second point in support of the idea that the President has the power and duty to refuse to execute unconstitutional laws is that the argument for constitutional legal review set forth in Marbury applies exactly the same way to each and every power and exercise of power by the President. The president has an independent province of constitutional interpretation. He's charged to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. I submit to you that faithful execution of the laws requires not executing unconstitutional laws because the premise of Marbury is that the Constitution is a supreme law and that the subordinate statutory law, the Sedition Act of 2017, is unlawful. Faithful execution, a specific presidential duty, requires the president to engage in the presidential equivalent of judicial review and strike down unconstitutional statutes. In addition, the president swears an oath, just like every other branch of government. In fact, there's a specific oath that the president is obliged to swear before he assumes office to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. How do you preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States if you go along and execute the Sedition Act of 2017, if you go ahead and execute the Supreme Court's decision in U.S. versus Paulson, if you go ahead and execute your beloved Professor Paulson. I submit to you that faithful execution, the obligation of your oath, require you in the performance of each and every one of your constitutional duties to act in conformity to your first best understanding of the Constitution. So <clears throat> the second part of my argument is that the president therefore has a duty to refuse to enforce or defend <laughs> unconstitutional laws. I list four broad categories. First of all, there are vetoes and pardons. President Andrew Jackson famously vetoed the recharter of the Bank of the United States on the grounds that it was unconstitutional, notwithstanding that it has been held, un held constitutional by the Supreme Court in McCulloch versus Maryland. You were all bludgeoned into reading Mac Mac McCulloch versus Maryland, spent about two, three weeks on it, and come, okay, okay. So. McCulloch upheld the constitutionality of the bank Jackson says, that does not bind me in the exercise of my independent presidential power with respect to the veto. What about pardons? There actually was an original Sedition Act, the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. When Jefferson is elected in 1800, he grants pardons to people who were convicted under the act and whose convictions were upheld by the judiciary as being constitutional. He grants pardons on the grounds that the judiciary's decision does not control him in the conduct of his independent presidential powers, including the pardon power, and he can pardon on constitutional grounds that have been rejected by the courts. Jefferson's also my first best example for the next argument, that it's the president's power to decline, to, 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 to exercise constitutional legal review extends to the non-execution of statutes. Jefferson nullified existing prosecutions or pending prosecutions for violations of the Sedition Act. He said, the act is unconstitutional, therefore it is my duty as president not to enforce it. So too, you should not enforce the Sedition Act of 2017. And note well that Jefferson did this notwithstanding the fact that the judiciary had validated 
at least in certain respects, the Sedition Acts of 1798. Third illustration is, is actually sort of a milder form of the previous one, and that's the idea of signing statements. Professor Prakash, in his keynote address this morning, referred to the fact that sometimes presidents sign bills but declare parts of them to be unconstitutional. Or they, they issue legislation, they, they issue uh, uh, signing statements that say, <clears throat> well, this aspect of the bill is constitutionally troublesome. We will construe it so as to avoid the constitutional difficulty. If I am correct in my general proposition, and I am, <laughs> it follows that this is really just a very mild-mannered exercise of the non-execution power. It is declaring in advance that this statute, which purports to be law, will not be enforced because this aspect of it, severable from the others, is unconstitutional. Finally, there is the idea of not defending in court laws that you think are unconstitutional. Now, some people criticize President Obama for refusing to defend the Defense of Marriage Act. That's the wrong criticism. If you think an act is unconstitutional and it is challenged in court, you as president should side with the side that is challenging the unconstitutionality. Obama did that. I disagree with him on the merits of his particular non-defense of DOMA, but in terms of constitutional power, of course you should not defend in court as constitutional what you think is unconstitutional. Obama's error was in enforcing DOMA, but not defending it. I think that is utterly unprincipled. The correct approach for a president is if you think a statute is unconstitutional, you don't go begging to the courts to bail you out on it. It is your affirmative, independent, non-delegable responsibility to refuse to act to enforce an unconstitutional statute. That is what take care that the laws be faithfully executed means. With me so far? You strike down the law. You refuse to enforce it. OK, my last point, and I'll just scratch the surface of this and give Vic Amar a big, fat target to shoot at. <coughs> is that the, this is the most controversial part, part. And I think I'm the only constitutional law professor in America who goes all the way down the slippery slope to the clearly correct answer. <laughs> and that is that the independent power of the president and duty to interpret the Constitution means that he has a duty not to enforce unconstitutional decisions or to abide by them in any respect whatsoever. Oh. Okay. I call this the Merriman power. I know some of you, at least in Professor Delahunty's class, have had the case of ex parte Merriman, where Lincoln refuses to comply with Chief Justice Taney, sitting as either a district judge or a circuit judge, circuit. order invalidating his suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. It is the only, I think, true instance of this happening in US history. But I think Lincoln is, in principle, correct. If the judicial decision is contrary to the Constitution and the president's duty is to the Constitution, you have to follow the, you have to follow the Constitution and not the act of a subordinate government entity that's contrary to it. The consequence of this is that the president has the constitutional power and duty to refuse to execute judicial decisions. I think Alexander Hamilton actually defended this proposition in passing in Federalist Number 78. He speaks of the judiciary having neither force nor will, but merely judgment. Don't stop there. And must ultimately depend on the executive arm for the efficacy of its own judgments. Ultimately, the president possesses a constitutional check on erroneous Supreme Court judgments and possesses the full constitutional power not to enforce them. Take a deep breath. That's dangerous. You don't want that in the hands of a President Trump. But I want it in your hands, and I want you not to execute me this afternoon. Am I right, or am I right? Vic? Uh, thank you, Mike, for uh, putting together today's event, and uh, I thank the organizers for in inviting me. It's my uh, pleasure to be here uh, for the first time at this, uh, at this great law school. Uh, let's begin with a point of relatively general agreement among uh, constitutional anal analysts, and I think that would be if the court has not spoken at all on an issue and a president thinks 
enforcement of a criminal statute against somebody would violate the Constitution that he can and should refrain from, uh, from implementing it. So that's a starting point, I think, on which we can all agree. Uh, I should say, though, and this is important and we'll double back to it, one of the reasons people agree on that is because just as Mike says that the Supreme Court is not the exclusive interpreter of the Constitution, um, although I'm not sure we'll all agree that it's not um, a superior interpreter in some settings, um, neither is the president going to be uh, in that setting uh, of a criminal prosecution a, uh, the uh, exclusive or supreme. If uh, the House or Senate thought the proposed measure uh, uh, defining the crime was unconstitutional, they could and should on that basis refuse to enact it. Um, if a court in, in, in any prosecution found it to be unconstitutional, the court should cut the defendant free. So in that sense, the president is exercising the same veto power, if you will, that all other three of the federal actors have in favor of the direction of liberty. This is Jefferson's argument, that it redounds to the benefit of liberty to require all four actors, House, Senate, Judiciary, and President, to agree before we lock someone in jail. Okay? Um, now, when we move to, from, from and, and, and as Mike adverted to, the, the pardon power is an overlay here that's relevant because, among other things, if you could, at the end of the day, pardon someone after she is convicted, what sense does it make to say you have to convict her in the first place? Now, you could say well, the pardon is more public and there's political accountability and the like, but the, the specter of the pardon power, the greater power, pardon power, might subsume the lesser power never to bring a pardon into relief. Now, when we move from the criminal to the civil realm, I think things get a little bit more complicated, especially if a court has spoken, and the Supreme Court in particular has spoken, and has approved or upheld something, a uh, statute in this case, that uh, the president might think is unconstitutional. Let me read to you from a 1994 uh, opinion of the Office of Legal Counsel, then uh, 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 Legal Counsel Walter Dellinger uh, wrote the following. He says, although there are times when a president should not enforce a statute he finds unconstitutional, the Supreme Court plays a special role in resolving disputes about the constitutionality of enactments. As a general matter, if the president believes that the court, Supreme Court, would sustain a particular provision as constitutional, the president should execute the statute notwithstanding his own beliefs about the constitutional issue. If, however, the president exercising his independent judgment determines both that the provision would violate the Constitution and that it is probable that the court would agree with him, then he has the authority, and I would say even indeed the, the duty, to decline to execute the statute. Now Mike says that makes no sense. If he has the power and the duty, he has the power and the duty regardless of what the court thinks. He's completely independent in this regard, and that's what Marbury says. And Mike is co completely correct that Marbury does not say that the court is the only expositor of the Constitution, the way it's often taught, but it does not say what Mike said it said either. Uh, there's a lot of arguments for judicial review in Marbury that do arguably distinguish between the court and other branches in a way that might support Dellinger's uh, 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 suggestion that the court plays a special role. So let's go through a few of this. It's true, a lot of Marbury is not about um, uh, whether a court or a president or Congress has the power. It's about, as Mike put it, whether the Constitution is supreme over inconsistent law. Right? So when, when, the, when, Marbury, when Marshall talks about the Supremacy Clause and he says it's the Constitution and only those laws that are uh, uh, um, enacted pursuant to it, um, that right there lets you know that there is a hierarchy and the Constitution's at the top. You're right, a lot of it's that way. But there are some arguments that go to the who rather than the what. Now, one of those arguments, the oath argument, does apply equally to the president and to the judges. They take an oath, and that, would, that, that one argues in favor of independence uh, as to interpret it, interpretation. But there are other arguments. There's other texts that Marshall invokes. He invokes Article 3 alongside Article 6 supremacy clause. And he gently suggests that the text of Article 3 
matches the text of Article 6. The Constitution, laws of the United States, and treaties which shall be made under its authority are the supreme law of the land. And Article 3 says the, the, the judicial power shall extend to the laws, to the Constitution, the cases arising under the Constitution, the laws, and the treaties of the United States. That parallelism suggests that the court has a special role to play in implementing the Supremacy Clause's protection of the Constitution on top. Uh, other arguments Marshall makes have to do with omnipotence. He says, if Congress could decide both what it wants to do and what its powers are, then it would be omnipotent, and that would be giving too much power to any one institution. Implicit in that is the court doesn't suffer from that concern because, as Mike also alluded to, it lacks the power of the purse and the power of the sword. So maybe the court is a less scary repository for special interpretive power to which Congress and the president must defer in some settings. The court does say, and, 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 and sometimes this word is misused, it is emphatically the province of the judiciary to say what the law is. He never says exclusively. So exclusively does not mean emphatically. But emphatically does not mean ordinarily either. Emphatically means especially, decidedly, undeniably. I looked up synonyms. I looked at, <laughs> at, 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 at not dictionaries of the day, but dictionaries of today. So I, I, didn't, I didn't have time. Okay? <laughs> that reminds me, in, uh, in, uh, in his opinion in Gonzalez versus Rach, uh, Justice Stevens, in, in deciding what the term commerce means for purposes of, hold, of upholding the Controlled Substance Act, he quotes, he quotes to a Webster's Dictionary from 1960-something or 70-something. And I'm thinking, why that dictionary? It's like, it's not a dictionary at the founding. It's not a dictionary today. It's a dictionary that had the widest definition of commerce that one could find, I think. <laughs> that, that, that's what it was. So I did not do the, do the, do the work, sorry. But emphatically is to be given to it. And let me identify a couple of other respects in which the courts are treated differently in this regard. Sai, um, I know he doesn't want to get drawn into the debate, but uh, this morning he said he thinks the president should be able to refrain from executing a statute he thinks is unconstitutional for the same reason that all of us can ignore a statute that we think is unconstitutional. We can violate it, we can defend on that basis, and we can win if we are right. If we establish to a judge that we're correct, then we're excused for having flouted this unconstitutional statute. Well, here's an interesting wrinkle. You can violate a statute that Congress passes and successfully defend on the ground that it's unconstitutional. If a court orders you to do something and you violate that court order, even if the court order was unconstitutional and even if you can convince a higher court that that's true, you are still guilty of contempt and you lose. It's called the collateral bar rule. So courts treat their own work product differently than they treat legislative work product. And this is part of the distinction between courts on the one hand and other branches on it. Let me give you another distinction. It's in the news today over sanctuary cities. Prince versus United States. Prince says the federal government can't commandeer state entities. Can't commandeer state legislature. New York versus United States can't commandeer state executive officials. Prince but it can commandeer courts. Why? Because court's special job is to apply and interpret laws, not to fashion laws. If that cuts in favor of their, command, you know, their commandeering ability, it also argues in favor of perhaps some special role of the kind that Dellinger has identified that courts, uh, courts have a distinctive job to, to perform in our, in, our function, in our system. And if you didn't think that was true at the founding, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an originalist of sorts, but I acknowledge that a lot has changed since then. All of Mike's arguments sound in, in, in the 18th century. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there that's not really consistent with that. We have to, we have to factor in the role of the court into that bigger, uh, into that bigger matrix. All right, um, three questions that, that uh, um, uh, Mike's broad thesis raised, uh, putting aside the Merriman factor, and I'll come back to that. And, and again, Maybe Mike's right and Dellinger's wrong. That even after the court has spoken, that the court should, uh, that the president should not, or at least has the power not to implement a statute he thinks is unconstitutional. One question is, how independent should that assessment be? Remember, even the court says that statutes come to it bearing a strong presumption of constitutionality. Should, at the very least, the president treat congressional work product with a similarly strong presumption of constitutionality? whatever that means. Second, 
and, si and, and, uh, uh, and, and Mike both at verge of this. Um, these signing statements. I don't have a problem with a president saying, I don't want to sign something because I think it's unconstitutional. I do have a problem with the picking and choosing. Um, you, sign, you sign it and you, 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 you accept what you like, you implement what you like, and you don't implement the other stuff that you don't like because you don't think it's constitutional. The problem is I don't think the severability clauses in most statutes currently in effect really give us the tools we need to decide the key question, namely, if Congress knew that you were going to refuse to enforce part of this because you thought it was unconstitutional, would they have wanted to give you the power to enforce the other part? And even if a severability clause that says if parts of this law are struck down, we should implement the rest, struck down is a term of art that kind of assumes and refers to courts, not to some president who may never have gone to law school, let alone, uh, or, you know, grade school perhaps <laughs> is from what we can tell. Um, uh, so I, 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 I really want to go back then and make sure that Congress wanted to, to give the power uh, with respect to the part of the statute that the president seems to want to uh, implement. Finally, with regard to the failure to defend, I think Mike is right that you know, the more principled position would be don't enforce if you're not going to defend. If you think it's unconstitutional, just don't do any of it. The reason that Obama and other presidents have, def have, have enforced but not defended is because they wanted to facilitate judicial resolution of the matter. They wanted to create a, a right case or controversy. Uh, under Article 3 because they, like Dellinger, think there's a special role for the courts to play either legally or at least politically um, in, in educating people as to what the Constitution means. My problem with all that is I don't understand for the life of me in Windsor and other cases why there is a ripe controversy if, if, the, if the United States agrees with the, with the plaintiff. Um, I, I, I think adversariness is more a part, I think all of standing doctrine is kind of made up and, 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 and not really uh, uh, t tethered to much in the Constitution. But if you're going to have it, adversariness should seem to be a, a decent part of it. And we just kind of read that out so we, could, so we could get to the gay marriage issue. Um, and that, that troubles me with regard to that, other, that, that aspect. OK, let's double back to the mayor. Let's be clear we understand what Mike is saying. Mike is saying that if, if President Trump thought that the Ninth Circuit ruling uh, restraining his original uh, entry order concerning uh, uh, Middle Eastern and African countries. If he thought that Ninth Circuit judicial order was unconstitutional, and for these purposes, that means basically legally flawed, which it might have been in certain, may, good example, I don't think the state of Washington had standing. And it was the, the, the argument the Ninth Circuit made that the state of Washington has standing because UW and WSU, they have foreign scholars who come and they enrich the university. That's absurd. Right? You think a Middle Eastern restaurant in Seattle can say, I have standing to assert the rights of, of, of non-citizens because my business is going to lose a few customers? We're not talking about injury in fact. We're talking about third party standing to step in in the shoes of non-citizens with no connection to you or anybody else in the United States. Okay? So it was, it was a, a flawed, and yet I'm still uncomfortable with the idea that a president could simply blow it off rather than appeal it and get the errors corrected. And I double back to where I started. The preference in favor of liberty that argues in the direction of a one house or one branch veto, giving the house, the senate, the president, and the judiciary all the power, all of them have a, an equal power to block action of the federal government that might threaten liberty, that cuts the other way with regard to flouting judicial decrees. Because those decrees themselves are designed to promote or protect the rights or liberties of some individuals. You've got a crisis here. You got, you got, you got an interest on both sides. So for Mike to just say, well, the, the, both sides get to do what they want, uh, and the president is, is co-equal so he can flout it, um, I don't think that's consistent with Jefferson's uh, original vision that we want a limited government and when in doubt government should do less not more under his situation when Lincoln is detaining people without habeas corpus or when Trump is 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 uh, deporting people um, uh, in violation of, a, of the Ninth Circuit's order that implicates liberty and rights on the other side and makes it very different from the, the statutory non-enforcement realm so I'll turn it back over to you Okay, we'll run over. If people need to sneak out for class A, they can. We'll do like two or three minute brief sure. mini rebuttals. 
Vic says civil cases might be different from criminal. I have a civil case for you, and this also answers his last objection. Dred Scott is a civil case. Dred Scott determines property ownership. It protects the liberty. It protects individual rights. The right it protects is the individual right of slaveholders to take slaves into new federal territory. I would submit that the same, you know, just because a judiciary has ruled nominally in favor of liberty does not mean that the decision is actually in favor of liberty. There's, there's, there's no equivalence there. He says uh, the Supreme Court sp plays a special role. Walter Dellinger said it in 1994. He was right. Uh, 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 Vic was right that Dellinger might be right and I might be wrong and I might be right. I, I actually think that, that Dellinger is simply wrong about this. Uh, there are institutional reasons and political reasons why uh, Assistant attorney generals don't advance the most aggressive view of it, but that does not mean that it is not the correct view. Marbury, he says, supports a special role because Article Three gives courts the power to decide cases arising under the Constitution. Yes, and Article Two gives the president the duty to take care that the laws be faithfully well, executed. Okay, well, they yeah. have different. <laughs> <clears throat> They have different specific responsibilities, and each has the co power of constitutional interpretation incident to the exercise of their specific constitutional responsibilities. Uh, he says another argument in Marbury is it would give a practical omnipotence to the legislative branch if their decisions were not checked. It would give a practical omnipotence to the Supreme Court if the judiciary's decisions went unchecked. Wherever you vest supreme interpretive power, you vested supreme power. I like to play this game with my liberal law school professor friends. I say, you can write the Constitution however you want. You get to have in it whatever you want, all your favorite provisions. But I get the exclusive power to interpret it. Ready to play? Who has the effective power? That if the power of, const of judicial interpretation is really the supreme power to order everybody and to bind them with your decisions, that is a supremacy. And that is exactly why the Marbury argument applies the same way. He says it's emphatically, emphatically the province of the judiciary to say what the law is in connection with deciding a case. It is emphatically the province and duty of the president to say what the law is and what the Constitution means when exercising his constitutional responsibilities and hopefully doing so in a faithful manner. The very next sentence, Marbury is always quoted for this. It is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is. Read the next sentence. Go back to your common law casebook. It says, those who apply the rule to particular cases have a duty to apply it consistently with the Constitution. That describes the president every bit as much as the judiciary. Uh, <clears throat> he says collateral bar rule. I actually teach this in the first week or so of civil procedure. So even if a court order is unconstitutional, you have to follow it, or so are the courts say. I think, though, Vic, and I, I think that doctrine is wrong. I think that the collateral bar rule, the idea that you have to comply with an unconstitutional order of the court, is unconstitutional and makes no sense. It is an instance of the judiciary dealing itself superior powers and it would deal to the other legislative branch. Uh, oh, how much more to say? Uh, it says, how independent should the power of executive review be? That's actually an interesting uh, question. In the exercise of presidential constitutional interpretation, you probably want a restrained presidential interpreter much as you want a restrained judicial interpreter. Restraint means uh, adhering to the actual commands of the Constitution and giving full and fair consideration to the views of other people who have thought seriously about the issue. All I'm saying is that when push comes to shove, when you can say categorically, undeniably, incontroversial, the, uh, controvertibly the law is unconstitutional, the judicial decision is uncontroversial, at whatever threshold level of uh, uh, repose is, is sufficient for you to draw that conclusion, that is when the power of constitutional interpretation checks, uh, kicks in. Could Trump defy the Ninth Circuit's injunction? <sighs> the logic of my theory and, you know, logic is not like a taxi cab. You can't just get off wherever you want. <clears throat> the logic of my theory dictates that the president could defy orders that he thinks are unlawful, that he has that power. That's dangerous. But wherever you locate uh, a supreme interpretive power, it's dangerous. That is why the framers wanted a system of checks and balances. If the president abuses interpretive authority, it is within the province and duty of Congress to check that errant interpretation with all of the checking powers at its disposal, including and going all the way up to impeachment. Finally, 
because the president does, rightfully, logically, constitutionally, have this independent duty of constitutional interpretation, it makes a huge difference who you elect. You don't want to elect someone who has no sensitivity to the Constitution, no judgments. But I think if you elect a president who is failing on those characteristics, you have bigger problems than the problem of independent constitutional interpretation. So, okay. A couple of points. Uh, first, let's look at the take care clause. This, I think, is an example of the category mistake that Mike uh, 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 kind of attributes to other people when looking at Marbury. The Take Care Clause says that the president shall take care that the laws are faithfully executed. But it doesn't say who shall define what those laws are. Again, it's question begging as to the who. The reason I think Article 3 and Article 6 go more to the who question than the Take Care Clause is because it's inherent in the judicial power, the power to say what the law is that jurisdiction is about. So when you line those up and it says the courts are the, are the ones, that's much more powerful evidence of a power to speak law than is a provision that talks about implementing law or enforcing law. You could say the president shall take care that, to faithfully execute the law as the law is determined by the law determiners. I'm not saying that's the only way to read it, but there's nothing self-defining about that. You're focusing on the take care part. I'm focusing on the law part. What is the law? Who takes the law? And, and for you to say, well, inherent in that is the power to decide what the law is, where does that come from? When I have an answer for Article 3, it comes from the judicial power, which has always been understood as the power to say what the law is. So that's one. Number two, it's true that the court has a lot of power if it's the final or the only or a special interpreter. But the point about um, uh, omnipotent, practical omnipotence, cannot be divorced from the larger discussion of how relatively powerless the courts are compared to the other two branches. So you yourself mentioned it uh, in Hamilton. They ultimately d d d d rely on other branches to get their work done, which is why it's scarier to give them special interpretive authority than it is to the, the, the branch with the purse or the sword. That's, that was my argument. You didn't take it head on when you just, uh, when you, when you just said that the courts could be uh, accused of having too much power. But I was comparing the omnipotence problem with the judiciary to the, to the other branches um, and, and whether they might be different in kind. Finally, back to the Merriman question. I mean, I don't have to, you can spin out, you don't have to look at the Ninth Circuit's uh, uh, immigration case. You can think of hundreds of other cases. There's a difference between refusing to enforce a court order, Dred Scott, and flouting a court order that tells you you cannot go forward with your policy. Seems to me that if we are a liberty-loving peoples, maybe I would concede that maybe a president does, you know, he's, Mr. The, the Tawny Court says that this is property and this person has to be able to carry property wherever he goes. I'm not, as a, as a president, I'm not gonna use my marshals or anybody to help him out. That's very different than I have a policy banning people, throwing them in jail, detaining them, X, Y, Z, the courts tell me I can't do that, and I'm just going to say, F you, I'm doing what I want. That seems to me very different. That's why earlier in the day I asked you the distinction between what do we mean by enforcing a court order? I think flouting a court order and failing to enforce a court order might be a distinction worth thinking about. So with that, I'll stop. I'm the moderator, but I don't know. <laughs> you know I've been so engrossed in this wonderful debate. We the schedule says we're done at 1.30, but I can't well, believe that's possible. Let's wait, so, move to a few questions. Is there a class in this room? Oh, they can wait. It's probably just property or something. Let's go to 1.35. <laughs> we've got, we got, we got nine minutes. Nine minutes. Eight minutes. Okay. Um, well, two points of view. Vic, I don't buy the civil criminal distinction. I don't understand that. I understand where, where it comes from. Well, pardon is one thing. Right there. Well, well pardon, but that's, that's a pardon point. That's right. a pardon power. Right. But the, the idea is the pardon power subsumes the lesser, the lesser power not to prosecute, which is why there's well, always been recognition of prosecutorial discretion. You seem to be doing a lot with the pardon power, but, but, but other, other than that, really, Mike is the problem. Okay. Oh. <laughs> 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 which is, so I, I get it, I, I'm, I'm with you until you get to supremacy, right? So there's a difference between, obviously, and the, the power to, to be an independent interpreter, and then the question of a clash of supremacy, 
And so how do you answer Vic's question that inherent in the Article Three power, um, right, which is, which is the core function of the court, right, as opposed to the Article Two power, the, ex the core function of executing the law. So inherent in the Article Three power comes with this notion of supremacy, because that's where the, the real ball of, of, of wax is. And so if you're really going to go to say <coughs> that the executive really does have that independent, not just to interpret, right, on, on their own, but when there's an absolute clash, and I agree the distinction between sort of positive and negative action, right? Um, so if you're gonna go there, I think the burden is on you to actually conclusively show, and I don't know that, that you've met that burden. So notwithstanding Vic's you know, flawed decision between civil and criminal, but I, I, it seems to me that, that on the core, on the, on the home run point, um, I, he's, he's convinced me. Oh, it's not a home run. It's a sacrifice bunt. <laughs> Still scores what? the run, baby. What? <laughs> Out at home plate. <laughs> Then it's not a successful sacrifice. Don't get into a debate with sports with me, Mike. You're, you're, out, you're literally out of your league, even though your brother's a, a, a hoops coach. The core question is, what is the judicial power? If, as you are both assuming, the judicial power is a power to bind everyone else to comply with your judgments and orders, whether they are right or wrong, I disagree with you. I think the judicial power is a power to decide cases in accordance with government law. It is not a power to direct the execution of judgments. The power of executing judgments, like executing statutes, is actually contemplated to be an executive power. The power to say what the law is in the context of the execution of laws is a core presidential power. I recognize that that's contrary to our legal culture, and some, perhaps for good practical reasons. But in terms of the Constitution itself dictating judicial supremacy, I don't think it gets there at all. The other aspect of your question is what I sometimes refer to as the meltdown scenario. What happens when push comes to shove? Mm. The judiciary is the least dangerous branch. It does have the least powers. I've heard objections to this thesis being that, well, if this would make the judiciary a mere cipher, all they could do is render opinions and decide cases. Mm. That is all they do. The judicial power is a power of principled, persuasive, independent judgment. That's not an insignificant power. Persuasive power, uh, independent, uh, principled judgment. Okay? But that is a far lesser power. The powers that the president has vis-a-vis -vis the judiciary are scarily superior. You're right. If you're devising a system and wish to vest interpretive supremacy someplace, I would rather vest it in the judiciary than the president. But I would most rather not vest interpretive supremacy anywhere. The branches are divided and uh, exist to check each other. That is core to the framers' constitutional vision of separation of powers, that none of the branches is superior to the others and binds the others in the exercise of their powers. OK. Oh, no, let, me, let me just respond. Yeah, yeah. So Mike said if we had to vest interpretive power, you know, supremacy. supremacy in one, it'd be courts but you'd prefer to not have any interpretive supremacy. But we're not just talking about interpretation, we're talking about actions in the real world. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, you know, for you to say, well, the, you know, the, the, the president should be able to interpret, it's not just that the president is interpreting, the president is then acting on his yes. interpretation <clears throat> in a way that, that restrains people's liberty and property and the like. I agree, it is an entirely dangerous power, but I believe that it is the logical consequence of the constitutional system the framers divide. Gide. So I had a question, uh, uh, Michael, one of, and, and maybe for both of you, um, I am actually sympathetic to the point of view that they have, but I'm not so sure of the implications. For the reason, the following reason, you can imagine a world in which he all of a sudden assumes supremacy status. We don't know why. <laughs> and um, he is now, for all kinds of reasons, he's now considered the supreme interpreter. Oh dear. <laughs> and this goes on for 50, 60, 70, 80 years, and it's working out well. People are happy, they're going to their grocery stores, everything. I mean, <laughs> even, if, even if I can't figure out textually where it came from, and it may be that he did something fishy to get it, I don't know. But as long as it works, right, we've coordinated around that. And my concern is that there's sort of an idea that Judicial supremacy is fine, uh, at least in a lot of people observe it, that 
there's not a strong need to disrupt it. Mm -hmm. And some of the players who want it are actually political players that are for it. And, and, and I say this last moment, the last thing with Key is that he may come into a room, let's say I am I'm Trump, and I ask the leading uh, constitutional lawyers, can I ignore this judgment? And they say, you know, by the way we read the Constitution, all of them in my office say, in the office, the executive office say, I think you, sh you should be able to ignore it. There's some inherent, we, we abide, he comes in and says, well, if you try to ignore it, I don't think the field agents will support you. They'll support the court. He tells me that because he said, field agents have adopted a sociological view that when the courts say one thing, they ought to obey it, not the president. And then you go like, well, maybe what I can do is find my folks in New York and issue, ask them, give them the order, and ignore, like, I'll, I'll, I'll create my own posse of enforcers. He says, well, you can try to do that, but Congress is going to come into play. And then he is going to say, I think Congress is going to support the court. In fact, I think the Republicans in Congress is going to support the court. And at that stage, Trump will back out and we'll have judicial supremacy. That, that's sort of the way it will work. It will be, a, I mean, we've adapted to it. It works. Everybody is roughly happy to it. The political players think that it works best for them. So it is. And you may have the best arguments as to why it never was originally. But yes, yes, yes. Well, my argument is one as to the original right, right. meaning of the constitutional. You might like judicial supremacy. Ah, oh, gosh, I don't think you like it when you get Dred Scott. I don't think you like it when you get Plessy versus Ferguson. I don't think you like it when you get Roe versus Wade. Judicial supremacy uh, presumes that the Supreme Court can make error, cannot make an error and that we're all just fine with going along. My bigger concern <clears throat> is that we are like sheep before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says something outrageous and we go, bah, bah, here we go along. We're going to adhere to what the Supreme Court has said just because it said it. Maybe in the mine run of cases, this would really have no difference. But I'm thinking about the important high profile cases where the Supreme Court makes a huge and dramatic error. Look around the world. Venezuela, the Supreme Court last week, before they undid it at their president's directive, declared that it would assume all the powers of the Congress. It dissolved the Congress of Venezuela. It is when push comes to shove and, and dictator Guy Charles makes an extraordinary <coughs> error as supreme interpreter that this power really comes into play in most ordinary circumstances. So are, the checks and balances will counteract errant interpretations. And core to my idea is that the president's duty is one of faithful constitutional interpretation and it does not dissolve the checks that other branches have if they wish to weigh in and overrule the president's interpretation. Go, so, go all of what you said is what I was getting at when I, when I reminded Mike that we live in a kind of a post-originalist real world. Um, where we've I don't got, like that world. Um, uh, where we, we, we have a lot of other stuff, on, uh, water under the bridge. That's, a, that's what I was getting at. But I do agree with Mike, and this goes back to the distinction between kind of action versus inaction. It becomes dangerous to let the interpretive muscles of institutions other than the court atrophy when you have presidents signing, not, not, not reserving certain parts of the law that they don't find unconstitutional. They just sign the whole thing into law uh, and say well, that's for the courts to decide. See McCain <coughs> and Gold. Um, uh, or or t if, if Trump thought his executive order was unconstitutional but that the courts would uphold it, he says, well, I think it's good policy, I think it's unconstitutional, but I think they'd uphold it, so I'm going to go forward. That's when we get into trouble. So, but I think all that's very different than flouting a judicial order, blocking a policy uh, that the government is trying to implement. I keep coming back to that. that. The ways in which the mindset you worry about and that I worry about um, be, being dangerous are ones in which uh, government is, is moving more in the direction of activity and I want to I create a system where uh, everything is, is structured so as to reduce, not increase, the possibility for government uh, overreaching. We get a Time for a couple more questions. Okay. Skip your classes. <laughs> Professor Sisk. I'm wondering how clarity of the constitutional directive plays into this. I heard each of you say something that, that, that brings this out. Uh, Mike keeps talking about, I'm talking about when it's clearly unconstitutional, when it's obviously, and then he, he, he 
proposes a hypothetical, yeah. which, although at the end he says the Supreme Court upholds 5 to 4, we all know that not a single member of the court would find any part of the hypothetical that he's posed to be constitutional. So it's not a real world scenario, and it's not a situation where any president's going to have to, to uphold that. Vic was talking about the contempt power as an example, uh, and, and it certainly is true. And, and like my, I teach in the civil procedure as well, that the fact that a lower that an, uh, an appellate court later finds that a court order was unconstitutional does not necessarily overturn the contempt mm -hmm. citation. But there's an exception to that, and the exception is when the lower court's order was obviously unconstitutional. So, for example, mm -hmm. uh, if a court, uh, a district court orders, and these are the cases that typically arise, a district orders a newspaper not to publish something, they publish it anyway and are held in contempt, the appellate court say, well, that was obviously an unconstitutional prior uh, restraint, and so therefore <coughs> the contempt citation is set aside. So at some level, clarity really matters. But when it's the debatable types of cases, uh, where there are reasonable arguments on each side, that's where perhaps we ought to be more concerned about a president insisting that his debatable approach should take priority over an alternative debatable approach the Supreme Court has adopted. So I would say yes, but even then only in a situation where we're talking about Mike's last category of flouting judicial orders. Because uh, again, whether Guy likes the criminal distinction, uh, civil line or not, let's just stay with the criminal law. Um, even if it's a close call as to whether uh, a, a, an enacted criminal statute uh, violates constitutional rights, um, I would want the president not to enforce that if he thought it was unconstitutional. Um, there's a related question of whether he gives any deference to Congress. We talked about that a, a bit. But uh, to me, the, the important line question is not really uh, you know, a debatable versus egregious. It's you know, which way does, does liberty cut inaction versus uh, um, uh, uh, overreaching enforcement. Uh, <clears throat> I once had a more senior attorney in the Department of Justice say to me, Michael, the, the secret of being a good extremist is to never blink. <laughs> <laughs> I could make a joke I, about who I that think was. <laughs> when, when push comes to shove, I think the clarity of the constitutional impropriety does not make a difference. I establish a really clear hypothetical as a test case, because if you believe in judicial supremacy, you have to slide all the way down the slippery slope and say no matter how erroneous it is, uh, you know, the fact of error does not absolve the president of the duty to comply with the Supreme Court's decisions. My standard actually would be with whatever standard of persuasiveness you otherwise impose upon yourself for believing or disbelieving a legal argument. When you are fully persuaded that a court decision is wrong, not necessarily clearly or incontrovertibly, when, when you are persuaded with whatever degree of psychological certitude and, and, and deference built into the views of others persuades you in a given case, you should not act contrary to your first best understanding of what the law actually requires. And I would apply that across the board. It, <clears throat> it, it is more extreme sounding than, than I think it, it actually is. I, 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 think, I think it's just a matter of, uh, of applying a consistent standard of adherence to the law no matter it, it, that you apply co consistently across whatever, whatever degree of proof standards you require for your own uh, conviction. Now, I, I want to address one other thing. You know, Vic keeps talking about the difference between flouting a judicial order and not enforcing a judicial order. I, you know, I'm just from a small town in northern Wisconsin. These sophisticated distinctions sometimes elude me. <clears throat> so, so let me just try to break it down. Um, if Lincoln refuses to re execute the decision in Dred Scott, mm -hmm. okay, it's not, you know, it's been the prior administration, so it's counterfactual. Refusing to execute the decision, and then the Supreme Court says, no, you are hereby ordered to execute the decision. We hereby order you to do it, and he says, I'm going to flout that judicial decision. I don't see a principal difference between the okay, two. Okay, but uh, the, uh, the, it's helpful, though, that you use that hypothetical, because it, it goes <coughs> back to this question. Because the, as implausible as Dred Scott might have been, 
it would be far more implausible still for a court to say that the president had to do something to, to follow up on it. And um, you know, you're right that you could say, well, if you posit these, uh, these, these absolutely unfathomable Supreme Court opinions, you get to the point of a crisis, and you have to decide who you're going to trust. Are you going to trust the president? Are you going to trust the court? And in those situations, as a general matter, I say you know, trusting the court over the president might make some, some good sense. You, you, before you got to the end, you said, if you think a court decision is wrong, you should do what you think the law requires. That's the way you used it. And I, I was struck by that phraseology because let's say Congress passes a law and the president wants to enforce it. And the, the, the courts say it's unconstitutional to enforce. The court's invoking the Constitution as a reason for its non-enforcement, whereas you're just invoking the law and your desire to implement it as your, your, your reason for wanting to go forward. And I just think that they're, they're not equivalents. So there are very few laws that are constitutionally required, is my point. These are, these are constitutionally permissible laws at best. And to override a court's de decision that a law violates the Constitution because you think it's a permissible and wise law, I just think that that's not paying adequate respect to judicial power to declare what the Constitution is. And that's uh, the last thing well, I'll, well, I'll, I'll, I'll... Let me, let me clarify <laughs> the hypothetical. The premise would have to be that the president believes that the Supreme Court's decision in validating the law is actually contrary to the Constitution. That it is an improper invalidation of the law. And so it really would be that he not only likes the policy and desires to implement it, uh, he's just executing the law in accordance with what he thinks is actually constitutional, and he thinks the Supreme Court decision in validating the law is not properly constitutional. So it really does become a constitutional. One last short question, then the next panel, and I hope you can all come, because it's war, national security, and foreign policy, is at 2 o'clock in the moot courtroom, uh, Mr. Giesen. <clears throat> Why should the executive treat this decision as binding, especially decisions that rest on shady grounds like penumbras, penumbras of privacy? Well, let me be clear. I think if there's some question as to whether a precedent would be upheld today, that it's perfectly appropriate for the executive branch, including the president, to do things that are contrary to that precedent. Uh, that would create a test case that, where we would see. That's different than violating an order that is directed at you, Donald J. Trump, not to implement this, exec this uh, um, uh, entry ban. That's a very different thing. Okay? That's okay. one question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.